In my last two videos, we looked at two seemingly unrelated sequences. First, the harmonic numbers, 1 plus a half plus a third up to 1 over n, and then the factorials, 1 times 2 times 3 up to n. We found ways to extend the domains of both functions to the reals, which had some pretty fun-looking graphs. But more importantly, these extensions allowed us to see that the two functions are closely related to each other in an unexpected way. What we didn't see is that these functions also have surprising connections to the trig functions we all know and love. In this video, we'll rediscover and rederive these connections. We'll be taking some results from my other videos as a starting point here. If you want to understand where they come from, you can find those videos linked in the description. Otherwise, I'll give a quick refresher now. We extended the domain of the harmonic numbers with this infinite sum, and we extended the domain of the factorials with this limit. Each of these functions satisfies a corresponding recursive formula, which was actually one of the key defining properties that guided our solutions. And finally, the surprising connection that I mentioned is that the extension of the harmonic numbers is the derivative of the logarithm of the factorial function, plus a constant called gamma, which is equal to this limit. Alright, I know I just threw out a lot of big formulas really fast, but I won't derive them here, as I already did in my other videos. If you haven't seen those videos, you don't really need to understand everything here as long as you can trust me that it all works. Now, I'd love to keep using the notation that I've been using, but I'd be going against the grain. By convention, the factorial function, represented with an exclamation mark, is still only defined on the natural numbers. For the extended version, we'll need a different symbol. Well, in 1809, a mathematician named Legendre used a capital gamma to represent this extended version, and that's been the standard ever since. But annoyingly, he didn't define it to equal x factorial, he defined it to equal x minus 1 factorial. There is a lot of discussion online about the possible reasons, or a few say lack thereof, that he defined it this way. My personal theory is that it was a prank, because I can never keep straight whether it's a minus 1 or a plus 1, and it feels like an unnecessary complication. But whatever the reason, the overwhelming majority of literature on the topic uses the gamma function, so I will too. You may have seen the gamma function defined as this integral, this is equivalent to our expression, and it allows us to see it from a whole different angle. But I'll stick with the product form, since it's the version we previously derived. We'll also use a similar replacement for the harmonic numbers. This is called the digamma function, and it's written with the Greek letter psi for some reason. The digamma function is defined to be the derivative of the logarithm of the gamma function. This definition follows directly from the connection between the harmonic numbers and the factorials, since with a little shuffling around, we can see that the digamma function is h of x minus 1 minus gamma. As one final note, the recursive formulas I mentioned still hold, but they look just a little different with these new functions. Alright, it's high time we actually get to the topic of the video. So let's take a look at these connections to the trig functions I promised. We'll start with the digamma function, because its connection to trig is kind of hiding in plain sight. In fact, a few people noticed it and pointed it out in the comments. The left side of the graph looks suspiciously like the graph of the tangent function, so maybe there's a connection there. To explore this, let's see if we can manipulate the digamma function to look even more like tangent. The most obvious way that the two functions differ is that tangent repeats in both directions, while digamma only has asymptotes going to the left. So let's fix that. We'll make a copy of the digamma function and flip it upside down, and then shift it one unit to the right. The formula for this upside down copy is now negative psi of 1 minus x. Now, the original has asymptotes at every non-positive integer, and the copy has asymptotes at every positive integer. So if we add the two together, we get a function with asymptotes at every integer. Now, let's see how close this graph is to tangent. We'll superimpose the graph of tangent of x, squish it horizontally by a factor of pi so it has the right period, and shift it over by one half so the asymptotes line up. And as a final touch, if we scale it vertically by a factor of pi, we really do seem to get a perfect match. So this is the connection between the harmonic numbers, or the digamma function, and trig. Now one quick modification, tangent offset by pi over 2 is the same as negative cotangent. 
and that takes up a little less space. So I'll use cotangent instead of tangent for the rest of the video. Now let's move on to the gamma function. I'm going to use Desmos, because the fancy animations just didn't have the same magic as watching an actual calculator do this one for real. Since the calculator has built-in support for fractional factorials, I can just define the gamma function as x minus 1 factorial. Note that the gamma function has a vertical asymptote at every non-positive integer. So if I take its reciprocal, all these asymptotes effectively become zeros. I'll also plot 1 divided by gamma of 1 minus x, which is the same thing but flipped horizontally, so it has a zero at every positive integer. The magic happens when I multiply these two versions together. It results in a perfect sine wave. And it doesn't just look a bit like a sine wave, it really is precisely equal to sine of pi x divided by pi. So what's going on here? Why does trig seem to randomly emerge when we combine these functions with themselves in these ways? Well, the answer lies in an interesting formula for calculating sine. This is often called the sine product formula, and just like pretty much everything else in this video, it was first discovered by Leonard Euler. In fact, this result contributed to his renown because it played a big part in his proof that the infinite sum of inverse squares equals pi squared over 6, which rocked the math world when it dropped. But you can learn more about that elsewhere, I need to keep myself on topic. How did Euler come up with this formula? Well, it's well known that, given a polynomial, we can take all of its zeros and use them to factor it into a product of binomials. Now, Euler was familiar with Taylor series, which tells us that we can express sine as sort of an infinite polynomial, loosely speaking. This is a fascinating topic of its own, but it's outside the scope of this video, so I'll just take it for granted. Euler asserted that what holds for a finite polynomial also holds for an infinite polynomial. Therefore, since sine has infinitely many zeros, one at every integer multiple of pi, his idea was to factor sine into a product involving its zeros. We'll repeat his process now. We'll start with just the central zero at x equals zero. It's easy to match this. The function y equals x has a zero there. Then, we can match the next two zeros by multiplying by pi plus x and pi minus x. This puts the zeros in the right place, but now we have a problem. Our function is way too steep. But we can fix this without too much trouble. To see how, let's go back to what we had with just x. This function is actually a great approximation for inputs very close to zero, because it matches the fact that sine of x has a slope of 1 there. But now let's take a look at these two binomials we added. When we plug in 0 for x, we can see that they're scaling the function by a factor of pi twice, which makes it almost 10 times too steep. We don't want to be scaling it at all, so we can fix this by dividing both binomials by pi, which undoes the scaling. Now our approximation is looking a lot better, so let's add the next two zeros at 2 pi and negative 2 pi. I've already divided both of these by 2 pi for the same reason. Then, continuing the pattern, we add the next zeros at 3 pi and negative 3 pi, and then, as we keep adding more and more, the function approaches sine. And that's all there is to it. The only work left is to wrap this up into a nice, compressed, unambiguous formula with product notation. First, we can split up all of the fractions and write them like this, which is arguably cleaner. Then, we can pair up all of the binomials like this matching each positive zero with its negative counterpart. Each line has 1 minus something times 1 plus that same thing. Remembering our algebra identities, this simplifies to a difference of squares. Finally, note that we have an infinite product following a simple pattern, so we can wrap it all up in product notation. And now we're really done. Now, I'm well aware that this really wasn't a proof. Sine isn't a polynomial, so factoring isn't guaranteed to work like this. Therefore, saying that this expression equals sine of x just because it has zeros in the same places is a bit of a stretch. Well, believe it or not, Euler himself never managed to rigorously prove this identity, and such a proof eluded mathematicians for a century. As such, I won't take it on myself to present a proof in this video, but I've linked a proof in the description for anyone who's curious. 
So, how does this formula help explain why the gamma function is related to sine? Well, remember that our gamma formula had evenly spaced zeros across the whole number line. That's pretty similar to what we did to derive the sine product formula. But to really see that they're the same, we just need to crank out some manipulations. As a first step, we'll multiply the top and the bottom by x. This is so that we can use the recursive formula to get the expression in a more symmetrical form. Now let's substitute in the definition of the gamma function for both instances. I know this is kind of a nightmare, but there are a lot of nice cancellations. First of all, there's a lot of plus one minus one. We have this lovely minus one in the gamma function's definition to thank for those. But they cancel right out. Next, since both limits exist, we can just use a single limit, and now we can pull out the n to the x and n to the minus x, which cancel each other out. Now, when we multiply two products, we can just combine what's inside, and since the only instance of n is in the top of the product now, we can use the infinite product shorthand. Now, the reciprocal of a product is the product of reciprocals, and just like we did with the sine product formula, we can split the fractions up and use difference of squares. Alright, that was a lot, so let me bring back what we started with so we don't forget where we came from. Now if we look back at the sine product formula, we can see that we almost have the same thing, except for this pi squared in the denominator. But if we do sine of pi x instead of just sine of x, we'll introduce a pi squared in the numerator which cancels with it. And if we divide both sides by pi, we get a perfect match. And thus, we've established the connection between the gamma function and sine. This equation is the gamma function's reflection formula, and it's usually written as the reciprocal of what we found because, well, it looks a bit neater that way. A reflection formula is just a name for an expression that relates a function to a horizontally flipped, or reflected, copy of itself. In this example, we're relating gamma of x to gamma of 1 minus x, which is its reflection across x equals 1 half. There's one cool special case that I just have to mention. If x is 1 half, then 1 minus x is also 1 half. So we get gamma of 1 half squared is equal to pi over sine of pi over 2. But since sine of pi over 2 is 1, we're just left with pi, which means that the gamma function of 1 half is the square root of pi. Now, technically, factorials are only defined on the natural numbers, but it's fun to relate this to the factorials anyway. Since the gamma function is the factorial function offset by 1, we can use the recursive formula to arrive at a great fun fact. 1 half factorial is the square root of pi over 2. Anyway, now that we've established the gamma sine connection, the digamma cotangent connection is actually pretty quick. Recall that the digamma function is defined as the derivative of the logarithm of the gamma function. Therefore, we can expect it to show up if we take the derivative of the logarithm of both sides of this reflection formula. On the left, we have a product inside the logarithm, so that splits into a sum of logarithms. The first term becomes psi of x, and the second becomes negative psi of 1 minus x. Now, the right side has a division inside the log, which splits into a difference of logs. The first one is now the derivative of a constant, so it's just zero. For this remaining derivative, we'll have to use the chain rule, which says that the derivative of g of f is g prime of f times f prime. In our case, g is the natural logarithm, so taking its derivative, we end up with just f prime over f. Applying this to our equation, we get this, and the derivative of sine of pi x is pi cosine of pi x. Finally, Cosine over sine is cotangent, and suddenly we have the digamma cotangent connection, so we're done. Now, I did something a bit sneaky here, and I don't want to sweep it under the rug. I used the properties of logarithms on functions that are sometimes negative, but the natural logarithm is only defined on the positive real numbers, so I was breaking the rules. This is the kind of thing that can get us into trouble, but in this case, it turns out to be fine. The derivative of the logarithm of a function has a name. It's called the logarithmic derivative. As we saw from the chain rule, it's equal to f prime over f. But where the original form requires the function to be positive, f prime over f works for any differentiable function. 
except where it equals zero. Because of this, f prime over f is actually the true definition of the logarithmic derivative, and it's the first thing you'll see if you look it up. The definition as the derivative of the logarithm is merely a convenient special case for when the function takes on only positive real numbers. But even with this new definition, it's still valid to use all of the properties of logarithms that we used. For instance, the logarithmic derivative of a product of two functions is the sum of logarithmic derivatives, and we can show that with the product rule. Also, the logarithmic derivative of a function raised to a power is that power times the logarithmic derivative of the function, which we can prove by using the power rule and the chain rule. Feel free to pause and verify, I'm not going to go into more detail here, but suffice it to say, everything we did with the logarithmic derivative is valid, if a slight abuse of notation. Alright, we've now derived the trig formulas that I promised at the beginning of the video, but we're still not quite finished. To recap, we started with the sine product formula. Granting that this formula works, we used it to prove the gamma function's reflection formula, which we then used to prove the digamma function's reflection formula. But there's a related formula for cotangent that I think this video would be incomplete without. This formula can be derived either from the digamma reflection formula or by the sine product formula. I'll use the sine product formula because it's easier. Now, it'll actually be easier to use the expanded version of the formula before we did anything fancy with product notation. It'll also be easier if we swap the order of terms in each numerator, because this makes the formula follow a clear pattern. Now, all we have to do is to take the logarithmic derivative of both sides. For the left side, sine of x simply transforms into cotangent of x. For the right side, remember that the logarithmic derivative of a product is the sum of logarithmic derivatives, so we can do each term separately. And this ends up being really simple. Note that multiplying a function by a non-zero constant has no effect on its logarithmic derivative, as the constant cancels with itself. Therefore, we can ignore all the denominators because they're just constants. Now every term is just x plus or minus some number, so the derivatives are all just 1. This means that the logarithmic derivatives are just 1 divided by whatever we have left. So, adding them all together, this is the new cotangent formula. This one can be expressed as a sum really nicely. We're just adding up 1 over x plus pi k, with k going from negative n to positive n and taking the limit as n goes to infinity. So now, we have a complete set of four formulas. But, at least the way I've presented them, the sine product formula is really the linchpin that holds it all together. If it wasn't true, then we'd lose our proofs of the other three formulas. So, I hope it's not too much of a disappointment that I gave an intuitive but hand-wavy derivation rather than a proof of the sine product formula. But really, these four equations are so closely related that proving any one of them would give you a solid foothold from which you could prove the others. In fact, my original plan for this video was to include a rigorous proof of the cotangent formula we just derived. But what I thought would take about 5 minutes to explain ended up taking closer to 20, and let's not even talk about how long it took to make this video. Therefore, I think it makes sense to end things here for now, and I'll leave that proof for another video. So, until then, thanks for watching.